Greetings, Myers parents and families. The purpose of this video is to continue our communication regarding the reopening plan for Myers Elementary School on February 1st, 2021. It will be quite a transition to have some of our students re-entering our building after such a long layoff. The, student, the staff and I at Myers are very excited to welcome them back and to ensure that we continue with a rich learning experience for those who are registered for in-person learning, as well as those who are registered as virtual learners. The goals of this presentation are very simple. We wanna make sure that we are clearly communicating everything that we are doing in order to ensure a rich and safe learning environment for all students. We wanna do that by explaining the safety measures, procedures and protocols that we've put in place. And I wanna give you an overview of what it will be like in, uh, in the life of your child a day at Myers Elementary School. I'll say that one again. I wanna give you an overview of what a day in the life of your child will be like as they engage in learning and in in-person instruction and as a virtual learner beginning February 1st. Before we delve any deeper into this video presentation, I wanna remind all parents that we have two virtual parent town hall meetings coming up in the very near future. One will be on January 19th at 7.30, utilizing the Zoom platform. And the second will be January 28th at seven o'clock, utilizing the Zoom platform as well. My hope is that after watching this brief video about the Myers reopening plan, that you will be able to email me any questions that you might have so that I might answer them at our town hall meetings to once again bridge the gap in communication to put us all on the same page as a Myers community about our reopening plan for February 1st. A brief overview of the topics that we will talk about in this video presentation are listed here. We'll talk about our enrollment overview for February 1st. We'll look at daily schedules, general safety protocols. We'll talk about our morning admission procedure, which is going to require quite a bit of cooperation from our parents and families. We'll talk about some of the things inside of that building, like hallway transitions and safety measures, bathroom procedures, lunchroom and recess procedures, as well as what the classrooms look like, because they're set up for success and safety. We'll also talk about what instruction will look like as we have students come into the building and have students at home going for an extended day from 9 to 340, we want to look at what the instructional model will look like and if it will differ slightly from what we currently are doing. We'll talk briefly about our visitors policy and then we'll delve slightly into our dismissal procedures with more information to come. The graph on your screen gives you an overall view of the students that are enrolled at Myers for the 2021 school year and how many of those students in each particular grade have registered for in-person instruction and how many have registered to be 100% virtual learners. You'll see that the graph shows our K through fourth grade students, our life skills students, and our students that join us from the Montgomery County Intermediate Unit. Those students totaling together a number of 301 students with about a 50-50 split of in-person registrants and 100% virtual registrants for February 1st. There's some key information that I wanna make sure that we are clear about before we proceed any further into this presentation. Early in our planning, there were many suggested instructional models, one of which was an A group of learners in person and a B group of learners that will come in person, with one group coming on Monday and Tuesday and the other group coming on Thursday and Friday. The Sheldonham School District did not adopt that model based upon the numbers from parent registration forms. We will be adopting a hybrid model A. 
That means that all students that have registered for in-person instruction beginning February 1st will come into the building four days per week. All students that have registered for in-person instruction beginning February 1st will come into the building four days per week with no alternating groups. Those students will come in on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, with Wednesdays remaining an asynchronous day for all students, both in-person and virtual learners. Our general schedule follows what we have done in previous years. The overall tenor of our schedule begins at nine o'clock and continues through 3.40 each day, 9 a.m. to 3.40 each day. One of the major differences is we will be beginning, we will start to let students into the building at 8.45. 8.45 is the earliest that students should arrive at school to begin their entry into the building, at which time they will report directly to their classrooms. Based upon the pandemic and our efforts to keep all students safe, School, the school grounds, such as the playground, the swings, the yard, will not be accessible to students and families before school or after school. In this presentation, we'll talk about where students should line up, where they should enter the building, and of course, what time they should arrive, which is no earlier than 8.45 a.m., which is when students will be let into the building. At the bottom of this slide, you can see that I wanted to distinguish between our 920, excuse me, our 9 a.m. to 120 synchronous new instruction time and our afternoon 120 to 340 asynchronous time. And to be clear, between 9 o'clock and 120, students will get engage, both virtual and in-person students will engage in synchronous new instruction, collaborating with one another via in-person and virtual in the subject areas of math, science, social studies, reading, and specials. We will continue to have our morning meetings as well. As we approach the afternoon from 120 to 340, all students, via in, whether be in person or at home, will engage in primarily asynchronous assignments that are prescribed by their teacher to meet their needs. The time between 120 and 340 will be a time of enrichment, extension, remediation, and support by teachers as students engage both at home and in school in asynchronous assignments. Students that are virtual will be able to engage with their teacher and receive the support they need through messaging them in their Google Classroom stream or making comments on particular assignments. Students that are in person will be able to raise their hands and gain the support they need from their teachers as well. It is also important to note that though this time in the afternoon between 120 and 340 will primarily be asynchronous, there are times when the teacher will prescribe students to work uh, in small groups. And when I say small groups, I mean virtual small groups to re-engage in learning. That might have a student that is in person and a student that is at home logging back on between 120 and 340 to gain much needed support or enrichment or extension during that time. Again, 9 to 120 is primarily synchronous new instruction. 120 to 340 is primarily asynchronous, but there are times when teachers will prescribe students that are at home learning virtually to re-engage uh, in synchronous discussions and group chats, and for those students that are in person to engage safely in a virtual small group as well. Also in our daily schedule, it's important to know that each class will have lunch, excuse me, each grade level will have their own lunch in the cafeteria, and they will continue to have breaks spread out throughout their day. Dismissal will be at 340 for all students, and we will have a staggered dismissal in order to avoid overcrowding and to ensure social distancing as we have walkers, 
carpoolers, bussers, and those who ride the van dismissing from the school each and every day. More information about our dismissal process will be shared as teachers ascertain which students are carpoolers versus which students are walkers, which are critical factors into how we activate our action plan for dismissal. I understand clearly that this might be difficult to see, but this gives just a general overview of what the schedule for your child would be for the day. You could see that in each grade, we start with our morning arrival at 8.45 to 9 o'clock. This is when students will be arriving outside of the building. They will be greeted by our greeters and teachers who are delighted to see them. We will review their health screener form that has been submitted by their parents and make sure that they get to their classroom safely. Our goal is to continue to have our morning meetings at 9 o'clock to 9.20, where we emphasize student voice and giving them an opportunity to voice things that matter to them, concerns that they might have, or topics of interest that they have. We'll continue throughout the day. As you see, the white section of each schedule will represent the synchronous learning that will take place and the latter part of the day towards the bottom of the schedule represents the asynchronous afternoon. I reiterate, we will have breaks throughout the day for each grade, we will have lunch and recess, and we will have recess and breaks in the afternoon as well. Teachers will share the specific schedule for your child based upon their grade as we quickly approach our February 1st return date. This schedule that you see on your screen is the schedule but as I stated, it might be difficult to see and will be shared by teachers as we approach February 1st. There are some general things that I'm gonna need support from parents each and every day. And I try, I'm going to try to emphasize them in no uncertain terms so that we are all on the same page and we have an expedient arrival that is safe and that is welcoming for all students. The most important thing that needs to be done each day by every parent is the completion of the Sheltonham School District Health Screener Form. All staff and students must complete this form each day before entering the school building. This is a general screening form that asks uh, questions related to COVID that will allow the nurse to ascertain if a student is in need or staff member, if they, they are in need of further supports and if they need to take certain precautions in order to ensure a school that is safe for all students and staff. The screener form must be completed each day by every family, for every student, and by every staff member prior to entering the building. I want to ask parents to complete the screener form by eight o'clock or just slightly shortly thereafter each and every day. This will ensure that when students arrive for entry, that there is no delay in students gaining access to the building and we can ensure that they have all the safety precautions and protocols met in order to have a successful day. The CSD screener is essential to ensuring that we can have a safe environment. Please begin to establish a procedure that will remind you to complete that health screener for all of your children by eight o'clock each day. With that, Students that do not have the health screener form completed will be facilitated in the cafeteria until which time we can contact their parent to make sure that they have completed the health screening form. Once that form is completed, we will immediately be notified digitally and it will populate on our technology devices and that student will be sent to class in a safe, and positive way, getting them off to a great start. It is, goes without saying that students that don't have the health screener form reported will be facilitated in a safe and socially distanced manner in the cafeteria. This is not a punishment. 
It is simply a precaution to make sure that we maintain a safe building for all staff and students. Another general safety tool that we have is the mandate for all staff and students to wear a mask. This precedent is established at every school in Sheltonham where masks are mandated in order to gain entry into the buildings. We wanna remind parents to begin to acclimate your child to wearing a mask each day. It can sometimes be cumbersome, but I'm sure you all agree that it is a necessary task in order for us to ensure a safe learning environment for all. If a student should forget their mask, we have a quantity of masks that we will be able to provide them. Our goal is that parents will send students with their masks, get them acclimated to wearing them, and even provide them with an extra mask should it become soiled or dirty or fall on the floor. We wanna make sure that students are comfortable and we will encourage them throughout the day to wear their mask and why they're doing it. And that is gonna help our school become a safe, place. Another safety tool that we're utilizing is the separation of all classes during recess. We consider each classroom to be its own individual cohort. And in order to, to ensure a safe environment, and the ability to trace any developments of COVID, each class will operate individually for large portions of the day, meaning they will sit near each other at lunch, they will play with each other only at recess, and they'll dismiss in a fashion that is similar. So when we say separation of classes in each grade, we won't have two third grade classes, uh, if it be Miss Rice and Miss Clipsham, playing together at recess. Yes, they will go outside and play with their mask on. They will have an assigned location and they will be able to engage with their classmates. But classes will not be playing with one another. I'm sure that the kids will still have a great time outside as they utilize the playground equipment and interact with the peers that are in their classroom. We have also embedded social distancing training and instruction, hand washing procedures into all of our school systems, whether it be students arriving in the morning to wash their hands washing their hands before they transition to lunch, uh, maintaining social distancing, washing their hands or using hand sanitizer when they come in from recess, and moving around the building in a socially distanced manner. We have signage posted throughout the building encouraging students to proper, to utilize proper health uh, methods in order to create and maintain a safe school environment. We'll get to some of those as we delve deeper into this presentation. Another thing that is essential, which is probably at the heart of most parents as it relates to sending their child back into the school, is how they will be cared for by a nurse. We will have a school nurse as normal with a nurse's office as we normally do. We also will have a COVID nurse and two separate locations for those who might be displaying symptoms that could possibly parallel some of those from COVID. Once again, just because a kid has a cough does not mean that they have COVID. And we understand that. We have the properly trained nursing staff in order to evaluate students and take the proper precautions we also have three separate locations, which would be a primary nurse's office, an isolation room for staff, and an isolation room for students, should they feel, uh, uh, should they not feel well, and be experiencing some symptoms that could possibly be associated with the COVID-19 pandemic. Lastly, we're going to limit our visitors in the building. While we appreciate everyone and all the contributions that the Myers community brings to our school, we're gonna ask that we only have essential visitors enter the building in order to make sure that we know who is in the building and that we can keep a safe and healthy environment.
I'll show you a series of pictures that kids will see when they come into the building, reminding them of what it means to be safe, respectful, and responsible as they re-enter the building. You'll see on the screen, first is our contactless check-in. That is a QR code that each staff member must utilize and complete to fill out the health screener before entering the building. This health screener information is monitored by our school nurse and COVID nurse only, and none of the student's health information or staff's health information will be shared with anyone. What you see on the screen is an example of how staff members will utilize the health screener. More information about how parents complete the health screener will be sent to you in the very near future. And as a reminder, I'm asking that parents complete the health screener for each of their children by eight o'clock each day. Also throughout the school, you will see the signage that says wear a mask and that masks are required on all CSD properties. That's just a reminder to all of our students, staff and faculty that masks are re required when entering the building. We have this signage posted throughout our building as a reminder to our students and staff. Also, we'll be posting the three C's. In addition to posting, we'll be delivering instruction and reminders and creating procedures in each classroom to embed these ideas into our daily school culture. The first C is clean and wash your hands with a procedure for doing that for 20 seconds, covering your cough or your sneeze, and contain germs by staying clear of others who are sick. We will embed the three C's into our classroom dynamics and the culture of our school in order to teach students how to be safe while in the school building. Each classroom has a sink, hand sanitizer, soap, and paper towels to allow for hand washing procedures, which we will encourage throughout the day. In addition, you'll see several things here. Each teacher's desk will be equipped with a plexiglass shield, paper towels, spray cleaner, alcohol baby wipes, and hand sanitizer. These small tools will go a far way in making sure that we keep clean classrooms that are sanitized and safe for all students. In addition, as I stated earlier, hand sanitizer, alcohol wipes, and face masks are available and will become staples of how we interact in the building each and every day. Here's a piece of critical information. Because of the need for social distancing procedures and the COVID-19 daily monitoring, we have made several changes to the daily admittance process. I want to talk to you in detail and I'll be honest with you that I'm going to be as detailed as possible and might be a bit lengthy as I describe our morning admit process. In order for us to function safely, efficiently, and have a welcoming environment for students, we all need to cooperate and follow our morning admit procedure. I understand that parents have to get to work in the morning. I believe we've designed a process that accomplishes an expedient arrival and admit process while ensuring that students are safe and enter the building in a positive and welcoming fashion. This is an overview of what our demographic for students for morning admit will look like. And let me be clear, we have four buses arriving, we have about three vans arriving, and the majority of our students on their registration form have been noted to be walkers or parent vehicle transports. Once again, we have four large buses, three vans, and a large portion of our parents have elected to have their students carpool or walk to and from school. With that being said, with 112 students either being a walker or a car transport, we gave special attention to that 
in our morning admit process. Let's get into it so that we can see exactly how we'll do this. Please pay attention to the images and I'll try to be as clear as possible. This is a diagram of our school. You'll notice in the middle, the large blue rectangles represent the Myers Elementary School. At the top of our screen, the broad uh, street is Montgomery Avenue, to the right is Glenwood Avenue, and running on a diagonal is Mill Road. Let me give you a second to orient yourself. On this diagram, you'll see several things. Let's take a look at the top section labeled Montgomery Avenue. That section was formerly our bus drop-off lane. It is no longer where our large buses will drop off beginning February 1st. Montgomery Avenue will be the car drop-off lane, and we'll get into that much deeper as we go forward. You'll notice that if you look at the bottom of this diagram, that you'll see four buses at the corner of Mill Road and Glenwood Road. That will be the large school bus drop-off location beginning February 1st. And the center schoolyard, where it says third slash fourth grade playground, will be the area where our walkers come into the schoolyard and enter the building. They will walk up the steps nearest the gym on Mill Road, and our walkers will enter the building following an outline procedure through the class door in the large schoolyard. I repeat, Montgomery Avenue is our car drop-off lane. The corner of Glenwood and Mill Road is for our large buses will drop off. And the stairway on Mill Road closest to the gym and the large schoolyard will be where our walkers will enter the school grounds and enter the building through the class door. Just in summary, it is imperative that all parents complete the screener by 8 a.m. or before. It is also imperative that students should not be dropped off at 8.45, before 8.45 a.m. When we say we have a car lane, it doesn't mean that I need you to pull there and then drop off your child at 8.45. I will get into that system very, very deeply, meaning we Though we have a car lane, there will be about a six car drop off area where a staff member will come to your car and welcome your student out of the vehicle. We have been careful to leave additional space at the front of the car line so that the car line can continue to move. We'll get into that as we continue. Once students arrive at 845 and their completion of the health screener has been verified, they will enter the building and will report straight to their classroom, being supported and escorted by staff members and hall monitors. As I said earlier, the schoolyard will not be open for gathering or play before school in the interest of safety. And it's imperative that parents know the proper location for their child to enter the building, which I will share with you as we continue in this presentation. Let's first start off with our bussers. As I stated earlier, our bussers will drop off at the corner of Glen, Wood Road, and Mill Road. And I showed you the location of the buses. They will be greeted by a staff member who will confirm the completion of their COVID screener form, and they will walk up the steps nearest the gym on Mill Road and enter the building in an orderly fashion. Students that have not completed the health screener form will be facilitated in a socially distanced, welcoming and safe manner in the cafeteria until such time that their parents are able to complete the health screening form. This diagram shows, indicated by the large green arrow at the bottom of the screen, where the buses will be located. The buses will pull there and park once they are greeted by our staff member who will verify their screening form has been completed, they will be escorted off of their buses up the stairs nearest to the gym on Mill Road through the large schoolyard into the class door. Our walkers.
students that are walking to school may not come onto school grounds until 8.45. And it is very unfortunate that kids who have not seen each other since March cannot gather and play together in the playground on the swings and talk and play football, which I know are staples of the Myers community. But in the interest of safety, we are going to be making sure that our grounds are kept empty and that students who arrive at school beginning at 845 will enter straight into the building in a socially distanced and organized fashion and welcomed into their classrooms by their teachers beginning at 845. Our walkers, as I stated, will enter the schoolyard through the steps on Mill Road closest to the gym. Once they arrive there, there will be cones placed on the ground six feet apart to allow a standing place as we slowly and methodically transition students in a safe manner into the building. We believe that we can facilitate this process in a fast fashion and make students feel welcome each and every day as they stand socially distanced and proceed into the building upon the checking of their completed health screening form. As I said, there will be plenty of staff located near that class door, which is where walkers will enter after they come up the Mill Road stairs nearest the gym. There will be cones on the ground, helping students stay socially distanced and six feet apart. And we will not be able to have games or football games or kickball games during the morning admit process starting at 845. But we will make every effort to get students in the building as fast as possible beginning at 845, those walkers. A large part of that is parents completing the health screener by 8 o'clock a.m. each day. That will avoid delays and will allow us to see digitally and very quickly who has uh, their health screening forms completed without any delay. This picture here gives you an idea of where our walkers will go. Most of us who are not new to Myers know exactly where the large schoolyard is and they know where the steps are on Mill Road closest to the gym. These pictures show how students will be asked to line up at the cones. It shows the entry door in which they will come and it gives you three different perspectives so that parents know where to take their student if they are a walker. All walkers from grades K through four will enter K through four will enter through the schoolyard. If they are a walker, a walker, K through four, they will enter through the schoolyard through these doors, utilizing the process that I described earlier. I apologize for the error on this page that says grades K through two. And I wanna reiterate at this moment that all students that are walkers to come to school in grades K through four, will enter the building through the large schoolyard, utilizing the Mill Road stairway closest to the gym, lining up at the cones, and then being welcomed into the building by a staff member. This diagram shown here with the green arrow gives another perspective of where our walkers will enter the schoolyard and where they will go into the building through the clasp door. The green arrow points directly to this door in the middle square that is surrounded by blue. I'll give you a moment to get yourself acclimated as to where walkers will enter the schoolyard and where they will enter the building and stand at the cones as we welcome them into the building in a safe and orderly fashion. One of the most uh, essential procedures that I'll need help with is for parents who are involved in dropping off their cars, their, their children in vehicles each and every day. The parent vehicle drop off will be located on Montgomery Avenue alongside the school in what is the former bus lane. When the line is formed on Montgomery Avenue, full of cars along the sidewalk, there will be a designated area where staff members will come to your car and signal you to allow your child to come out. Once the cars pull up and more cars are in the designated drop-off area, we will welcome those students out of their vehicles and those cars will then proceed up. We will continue this process 
with approximately a five to six car drop off area. And proceed through morning at mint, welcoming students into the building. The car lane is on Montgomery Avenue. Just because you pull up to Montgomery Avenue, I'm asking that you do not just let your child out onto the sidewalk, that you keep your child in the vehicle until you get into the drop off zone on Montgomery Avenue, at which time a staff member will invite the students out of the vehicle and escort them to their lineup and entry location. As I stated, a staff member will come to your car once your car on Montgomery Avenue arrives up to the drop off location, welcoming your child out. We recommend that you put your child in the back seat and have them exit on the passenger side in order to expedite things. And please do not pull around the person that is in front of you. If we work together, this can go quickly. I have a couple pictures that I would like to show you. We tried to be diligent in our planning to allow for a very lengthy car line on Montgomery Avenue with a drop off zone within that car line, leaving space at the front of that car line for cars that have dropped off their child to proceed forward to keep the line moving expeditiously. I'm asking that all students in grades K, one and two, as well as any student that's new to Myers, on that first week to have a sign that says their name and that says their teacher. It's not lost on me that my kindergartners will be entering our building for the first time. And with them wearing masks, we wanna make sure that we know who they are and give them a rich, warm welcome and call them by name. If parents of kindergarten, first and second grade students can equip them with a sign that simply has their first and last name, as well as their teacher, we'll be able to welcome all of our kindergarten, first, second graders, as well as our students that are new to Myers and make sure that they get to their classroom safely as they enter what could be a new environment for them with this being the first time that they enter the school. Parents, if you could cooperate with us by providing them a sign with their name and their teacher's name, it will help this process run smoothly and ensure that we can welcome the students into the building into an inviting and warm atmosphere. This diagram shows Montgomery Avenue as indicated by the large green arrows. You'll see that it's noted parent drop off line. The red arrows indicate a line which flows over onto Mill Road onto Montgomery Avenue, and as cars progress up Montgomery Avenue, the green area labeled parent drop-off zone is where students should be let out of their vehicles. They should not be let out of their vehicles before they reach the drop-off zone and are welcome to exit the vehicle by a staff member. You'll note also that after the drop-off zone, there's a significant stretch of road allowing cars to move up and to keep the flow of traffic moving so that we can continuously have five to six cars in our drop-off zone. I ask parents not to drop off their students in the drop-off line, but to wait until they reach the drop-off zone to allow their child out of the vehicle. We do not want any cars to pull around and cause an unsafe traffic pattern in front of the school. We wanna make sure that everyone is safe and we will make sure that we do everything in our power to make sure that we have an expedient, safe, and welcoming drop-off for all parents who are dropping off their children in the car drop-off line. I'll leave this diagram up for a minute to allow you to acclimate yourself. I also wanted to give some real life images so that you could see what the car drop-off lane might look like and where it might be. This picture was taken by me standing on the platform right outside of the main office. You can see that the large orange cones at the top of this picture indicate where the car drop-off zone will begin. And you'll notice that everything 
Uh, beyond that is where cars will be lined up in order to drop off their child. Each of those colorful cones represents the location of where a car will be. The cones that are orange and larger that are towards the middle of the street symbolize the drop-off zone, where those cars within that area will be allowed to drop off their children upon them being welcomed. Students in grades K, 1, and 2 will proceed down the ramp that is bordered by two black railings. And we'll show closer pictures of that as we go. Here's another image. This is the Montgomery Avenue car drop off lane. You will see that it stops at the black railed ramp and that the area beyond the black railed ramp proceeding towards the main entrance is where cars will pull up after dropping off their child so that they, uh, so that we can keep the car line moving safely. Again, I ask that you do not pull around, but that we will make every effort to have adequate staff in front of the school to welcome students out of the vehicle in the car drop off zone, which is part of the car drop off line. Here's another image. This image shows that it's quite an extensive uh, lane that can hold quite a few cars at one time. We tried to make sure that we had ample space for cars to line up without having to double park, which we do not want to happen. And that we could fit as many cars along the sidewalk as possible as they wait patiently to progress up to the Black World area where we have our drop off zone. Parents, I know many of you are delighted to hear that we will have the support of our local police department in organizing traffic during our drop off procedures for that first week. I think it's essential that we maintain, that we establish a procedure and a precedent to make sure that we keep all students safe by all of us adhering to these procedures. Here once again is another picture. This is important. This black railed area represents the front of the student drop off lane for those who are in carpools. Students in K through two, when they get out of their vehicles, have a very short walk. They will stand at each of these cones and be welcomed right into the door at the end of this ramp. I repeat, students in grades K, one and two will exit their vehicles in the parent drop off zone and have a very short walk to this ramp where they will stand socially distanced at the cones and be welcomed by staff and escorted to their classrooms. This is specifically for those who are being dropped off in the carpool lane. If I were to go back, this gives you a perspective of the entire car drop off lane. And you can see where that area that students in grades K, one and two will exit the car drop off area and proceed a very short walk to that ramped area down the ramp, standing socially distanced where they'll be welcomed by staff and escorted to their classrooms. Students in grades three and four will enter through a separate door. The car drop off lane has not changed. It is still in that location. And rather than exiting and going down the ramp, Students in third and fourth grade will proceed up the sidewalk and enter through the doors at the teacher's parking lot, which is shown right here on our first image on the left. You can see that students will get out of their cars in the car drop off lane in the designated area and third and fourth graders will not enter the same doors K, one and two. They'll proceed up Montgomery Avenue, a slight walk to the side of the building and they will enter through the teacher parking lot doors following the same socially distanced procedures. We hope that dividing students K, one and two from three and four will help encourage a safe and expedient welcoming entrance into the building each and every day. These images show exactly where that door for third and fourth graders will be. It shows how they will stand socially distanced as they quickly progress into the building and being greeted upon verification of their health and safety screening form and what that entryway will look like.
Now that we've had a discussion about Morning Admit, let's take a moment and talk about hallway transitioning. We want to make sure that as students transition through the building, that they maintain a socially distant uh, protocol from one another. So we've paid special attention to the flow of, of our hallways, the amount of students that will be in our hallways at one time in order to make sure we maintain a healthy school. We will do that through ensuring that students uh, in the hallway at one time are minimized throughout the day. We will also do that by ensuring that students wear their mask and with signage posted in the building, helping remind students just how far six feet apart from one another is. In addition, we will have hallway monitors to help encourage students and remind them to keep their mask on and to stay socially distanced in a polite and kind way. We recognize that this is not something that many students are used to doing. So we are vested in making sure that we encourage them, that we teach them, that we remind them about safety precautions and procedures to be followed throughout the day. We hope to do this through our lessons, through our school staff, and through the posting of signage throughout the building. Myers has a unique footprint. Unlike other schools that might be a square or a rectangle, we have multi-way hallways. So we were very intentional about using arrows and floor tape in order to tell which student, excuse me, in order to tell students which side of the hallway to walk on as they proceed throughout the building in an effort to maintain social distancing. In addition, we have special entry points for the cafeteria, exit points for the cafeteria, entry and exit points for lunch, and as I already stated, specified entry points for morning admit and dismissal. We will also utilize a class bathroom schedule to make sure that when students have to use the bathroom outside of the designated times, which of course will happen, that we don't have large numbers of students gathering in the bathroom at one time. We'll talk about that in a little more detail as we proceed. These images here show just a glimpse of the outstanding work that the staff at Myers has done in outfitting our school with signage, telling students which way to travel in the hallway, reminding students to remain socially distant while still maintaining a beautiful school. I'm sure that when students return, they'll be excited to be in the building, they'll be excited to see their peers, and we'll be excited to see them and hopefully utilize the signage that has been posted by our school staff to remind students to have some directionality in the hallway as they travel and to maintain social distancing of six feet apart. And of course, to always wear their mask. Here's just another example of signage that's posted in the main office, because as I said, these policies are not just for students, they're for staff as well. A couple things that are important it is worth noting that all water fountains in the hallways have been disconnected. This is critical as we know that the pandemic uh, can be passed in various ways. We wanna make sure that we don't utilize water fountains at this time, in addition to sharing materials and other things. A positive thing is that we have installed more hand sanitizers in the hallways so that students can ex uh, have access to them in addition to the hand sanitizer that's in each classroom and the sink so that students can maintain healthy hand washing procedures throughout the day. As it relates to bathroom usage, we're fortunate to be a school in which every K-2 classroom has a bathroom within their room. And teachers will work with students on procedures for making sure that they use the bathroom in a safe way washing their hands before going in and when coming out. And as it relates to our third and fourth grade classrooms that do not have bathrooms, those grades will utilize a bathroom schedule three times a day. The purpose of that is to make sure that we do not have large groups of classes mixing with each other in the hallway as they await the bathroom. 
we were very strategic in planning out a schedule around morning, afternoon, and late afternoon that allows one class at a time to utilize the bathroom in a safe, expedient, and organized fashion, with the goal being not to have different cohorts or classes intermingle with one another and to eliminate gathering in the bathroom and ensure supervision of those students who are in that bathroom by a teacher in the hallway. I absolutely understand that students will have to go to the bathroom at times other than those scheduled on the bathroom schedule. And that's, that's okay. We will have hall monitors that will ensure that while students are waiting in the hallway that they are socially distanced wearing their mask and that bathrooms do not amass a crowd of students uh, uh, resulting in social gathering. I repeat, though we have a bathroom schedule for students in third and fourth grade, they will be able to use the bathroom should they need to, with monitors being in the hallway to help ensure mask wearing, social distancing, and healthy protocols. The lunchroom is another critical part of our action plan for our return to school on February 1st. Each grade will eat lunch in the cafeteria divided by grade. We'll have a lunch period for K, one, two, three, and four, all separate, with each class for their respective lunch arriving to the lunchroom in a staggered format. For example, if we were to take our first grade classes, Ms. Giza, Ms. Moore, and Ms. Hockaday, all three classes would have lunch at the same time, but they would arrive to the cafeteria, cafeteria entering through the specified door in a staggered fashion. First, Ms. Giza's class would arrive and have time to get their lunch, sit in their assigned seats, and begin eating, followed by Ms. Hockaday and Ms. Moore. All students would have the same amount of time to eat their lunch. They would take their mask off after sitting in their assigned seat with their lunches, eat their lunches, put their mask back on when they're finished, and socialize with their friends who are sitting a safe distance away from them and wearing their mask as well. We'll follow that same staggered arrival procedure for each grade, as each class arrives through the same door, eating lunch in their respective assigned seat, taking off their mask, and once they finish eating, reaffixing their masks and having a social interaction with their peers. We understand that it's very critical for students of this age to have that social engagement and that using safety precautions does not mean that we eliminate every opportunity for students to engage with one another, but we can do so in a safe way. You will notice that while in the cafeteria, any student that needs free lunch will be given a free lunch for that day. I understand that some parents will be sending lunch with their children, which is okay as well. But every student, should they need a free lunch, should get them. And they will be available. We will not be having a la carte purchases or the exchange of money in the cafeteria. However, students will give their ID number or their name and they will receive their lunch um, for free. Students will not be per permitted to share food. And as I said before, students will wear their mask as they gather their food. They will go to their seat. Once they sit in their assigned seat, they'll take off their mask and they'll enjoy their lunch and relax and have some downtime. And after they finish their lunch, they'll put their mask back on and they'll be able to have a conversation with their friends and dialogue and interact in a safe and socially distanced way. We have adequate staff in the cafeteria, which will help facilitate students uh, during lunch so that they can have a free and functioning lunch period and engage with their friends in a safe manner. This diagram shows what the cafeteria setup will look like with each gray rectangle representing a 12 foot long table and the X's represent where students will sit at those tables. You'll notice that each child sits at one end of the 12 foot table and that all the students are sitting on the same side of the table facing forward in the same direction. You'll also notice that the tables are six feet apart from one another, ensuring a socially distanced environment. This is a picture of what that diagram looks like in actuality. You'll notice that our tables mirror the diagram and that the decals on each chair, which you'll see are yellow, indicate where each child will be sitting during the lunch period. We think that this is a safe and inviting 
lunch atmosphere, which allows students to be a part of a community while maintaining their safety. It's just another image of the sign that says, please sit here, reminding students where to sit and also giving you a perspective of how far students will be sitting from each other while at lunch. These images show to the left where students will stand socially distanced in order to line up to receive their lunch. And the image on the right shows where students will line up socially distanced in order to proceed out to recess through the exit door of the cafeteria. It goes without saying that before proceeding to recess, students will sanitize their hands. And once the cafeteria is completely empty, the cafeteria will be sanitized by our facility staff uh, prior to our next group of students arriving for the next lunch period. As I said, students will have recess each and every day. And before they go to recess, they'll have hand sanitizer. And when they come back in from recess, they will have hand sanitizer as well. Students will be required to wear their mask while at recess. And they will not be allowed to share personal items for the obvious reason of safety. Students will, however, be permitted to use playground equipment such as swings and slides, uh, which will be cleaned routinely. In an effort to make sure that we keep groups of students together while still maintaining an opportunity for them to collaborate, communicate, and have community, each group or class will have recess in a particular location which will rotate each day on a Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, or Friday. Each class will have a designated play area. This is just a, an example of those five play areas, excuse me, those six play areas that we have, which students will frequent as a class. Remind, remember, each of our grades has at the most three or four classrooms in each grade. And as they go out to lunch, they will maintain uh, social distance from each other's classes, but they will not be socially distanced from each other as they play and communicate and have downtime at recess. Just a reminder, they will rotate between these locations as they have recess on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday after lunch and in the afternoon for students in grades K through two. They will wear their mask and they will interact with their peers in their classrooms. And hopefully this much needed downtime to run and jump and relax will refresh them for the afternoon of learning and resuming instruction. Many of you wonder what classrooms will look like. So I wanted to give you a picture of what the socially distanced classrooms will look like, which is a little different than what they looked like prior to the pandemic. You'll notice the excess furniture has been removed from the classroom in order to increase um, space so that students can have uh, desks that are six feet or more apart from one another. This includes having their desk distance from the teacher. You'll see in this image that each student has their own area and that there's ample space in the classroom for students to function and engage in a safe manner while wearing their mask and learning from their teacher. Here's a few more images of different classrooms. You'll see in all those images, the excess furniture has been removed, that students' desks are socially distanced from one another, and that we still have a very warm and inviting environment where learning will take place each and every day. A reminder about what it will be like as it relates to what happens in that classroom. We know what it will look like, but what will take place there as it relates to teaching and learning? We can divide this into two parts, an a.m. instructional day and a p.m. instructional day. Between 9 a.m. and 1.20 will be where all synchronous new instruction takes place in the areas of math, reading, science, social studies. And in the afternoon will be primarily asynchronous instruction for those that are at home and those who are in person. Once again, between 9 and 1.20 will be synchronous new instruction for students at home and at school. And as we progress through the day, between 120 and 340, the primary instructional format will be asynchronous for those who are in person and for those who are at home. It is worth noting that teachers often might reconnect with those virtual learners at home or connect with the students who are in school in those afternoons to perform remediation groups, enrichment groups, extension groups, 
in a safe virtual manner. So though that afternoon time between 120 and 340 is primarily asynchronous, there might be times where the teacher re-engages with students at home or re-engages with students in a different capacity in the in-person environment. As we get closer to our arrival date, we'll get more information about our dismissal procedures. Much of that information is contingent upon the teachers gaining the information about our walkers and our carpoolers, which directly feeds our action plan for how we will dismiss students safely by van, by bus, by carpool and walkers. Stay tuned for more information about our dismissal process. I hope that the videos part one and part two were able to bring clarity, increase communication and increase uh, our overall collective knowledge of what direction we're heading as we head to opening up Myers on February 1st for our students to return for in-person instruction and we engage our 100% virtual learners. Again, I would like to remind you that we do have our town hall meetings coming up on January 19th from 7.30 uh, to, on Zoom and on January 28th at 7 p.m. utilizing Zoom as well. And as I stated at the beginning, after watching this presentation, please email me any questions you might have at jlytle at sheltonhand.org so that I might address your questions at our upcoming town hall meetings. As always, thank you for your participation and your collaboration. I look forward to seeing you at our town halls and please forward me any questions regarding our reopening plan to jlytle at sheltonhand.org so that I might address them and be prepared for addressing them at our town hall. Thank you for all you do and enjoy the rest of your day.